In parts A and B of this video, we're going to look at how you can measure and analyze rates of reaction experimentally, and in doing so, learn something about the reaction. First, a quick definition of rate. The rate of a reaction is how fast it proceeds, its speed. Most of the time when you're studying rates, you will measure the concentrations of reactants and products in moles per litre. And because you're looking at how fast the reactants are being used up, or how fast the products are being produced, the speed of your reaction is therefore measured as the change in concentration per time. This means the units are moles per litre per time. And the time unit can be whatever's convenient, seconds, minutes, or hours or days if it's a slow reaction. This assumes, however, that you're able to measure concentrations in your reaction. If that's difficult, you might instead measure the mass of a reactant or product, like if it's a gas. In this case, you can also express rates as grams per second or moles per second. Second, a couple of notes about stoichiometry. You're going to need your stoichiometry skills in kinetics in order to predict, measure and calculate amounts and concentrations of reactants and products. If you know the rate at which one of your chemicals is being used up, stoichiometry can tell you how fast the others are being used or produced. For instance, in this hypothetical reaction we've got here, A plus 3B goes to 2C. Say A is being used up at 0 0.01 moles per litre per second. You can see from the stoichiometry that 3Bs are used for every 1A. That means B must be used up three times as fast as A. So the rate at which B is consumed is 3 times 0.01 equals 0.03 moles per litre per second. And you can see that two C's are produced for each A that's used up. So the rate at which C is produced is 2 times A, which is 0.02 moles per litre per second. However, knowing the stoichiometry of a reaction can't help you predict the rate from scratch. This you have to find out by experiment. For instance, we had to measure the rate of consumption of A in the example above before we could uh, work out anything about the rates um, of B and C. Third, since we need to measure rates experimentally, we'd better have some experimental ways of doing it. We want to know how fast a reactant is being used up or a product is being produced, so we need some way of detecting amounts of these chemicals at different points in the reaction. Here are some common ways of doing it. If one of your reactants or products is a gas, you have a couple of ways of doing it. You could measure the volume of the gas used or produced. You could measure a change in pressure. Or you could measure a change in mass, either as the gas escapes, if it's a product, or as the gas is incorporated into the reaction mixture, if it's a reactant. If you have a solution with a reactant or product that can be titrated, then you can do titrometric analysis, where you remove small samples from your reaction mixture at regular times and titrate it to find out how much there is. To do this accurately, you need a way of quenching or stopping the reaction in the sample that you remove, so that your little sample doesn't keep on reacting while you're trying to titrate it. A back titration is a good way to do this. If you have a reactant or product that's coloured, or absorbs ultraviolet light, then you can track its presence using spectrometry. A spectrometer shines a beam of light through your sample and detects how much of that light is absorbed. The absorbance of the sample is directly proportional to the concentration of your chemical, so that can be a very convenient way of detecting concentration. If you have an aqueous reactant or product that's ionic, then you can track its present presence using conductivity. As the quantity of ions increases or decreases in your solution, you'll register a change in conductivity, and this can also be used to calculate concentrations. And finally, there's also pH. If acidic or basic species are involved in the reaction, then any change in their concentration will lead to a change in pH, which can be tracked with a pH meter. OK, now let's look at some actual data from a rates experiment. The reaction equation is here. We're going to react butyl chloride with water to give butanol and hydrochloric acid. An experimentalist has performed this reaction and she measures the concentration of butyl chloride at various times. What can she do with this information? Well, what can you ever do with a table of data? You can graph it. Graphs are lovely and also useful. So we'll use a scatter graph and this is what we get. You can see the concentration of butyl chloride starts high and then decreases as the reaction proceeds and it's used up. So what feature of this graph gives us information about how fast the reaction is proceeding? Well, it's a bit like a speed graph. 
Here's a random distance time graph that I just made up. Say it's tracking a runner. Distance is on the y-axis, that's how far the runner's gone, and time is on the x-axis, that's how long they're taking. And you can see from the slope of the graph, its gradient, how fast the runner was moving. You can see that for the first four seconds, the runner was going at a constant speed because the line is straight. But then the line gets steeper. This indicates the runner got faster. And then later, at about seven seconds, they slowed down again. The reason you know they're getting faster is that the slope or the gradient of the line changed. Gradient is calculated as rise over run. For this graph, that means the distance divided by the time, and that gives you the speed. It's the same for our chemical rate graph. The gradient of the line tells you the rate of the reaction. And here again, the gradient is found as rise over run, which is the change in concentration of butyl chloride divided by the change in time. Now, you can see that this line isn't straight, it's curving. It starts off quite steep, but gets less and less steep as the reaction goes on. This means that the rate of reaction is decreasing. It's slowing down as time goes on. All right, so how do we calculate the rate? Well, it's still rise over run, but because this graph is a curve, the gradient is always changing. So we're gonna need to choose a time interval and then calculate the average rate for that time interval. So say we choose the time interval from 200 to 500 seconds. Then for that change in time, that's 300 seconds, we work out how much the concentration change, and then we divide one by the other. And that gives us the average rate for that time period. You can see that if you chose a different time, for instance, the first 100 seconds, then you would get a different rate. Graphing rate data is useful because you get a quick visual idea of how the rate varies through the reaction. You can also plot data sets from different experiments and visually compare which ones are faster or slower. However, it's also possible to calculate the rate from a data set without having to graph it. So we'll stay with the same data set as on the previous slide. We know that the average rate is calculated as the change in concentration over the change in time. So we can therefore calculate an average rate for each time interval that we've measured a concentration for. Note that the triangle here is the Greek capital letter delta, and it means change in, or the final value minus the initial value. So for the first two data points, the change in concentration of butyl chloride is 0.0905 minus 0.1, and the time interval is 50 seconds. So this gives an average rate of 0 0.00019 moles per litre per second. It's worth paying attention to the sign here for a moment. The rate of a reaction is defined to be positive. However, if you study the rate by measuring the change in concentration of a reactant, it's naturally going to be negative since the reactant is being used up. Hence, for this rate calculation, we put a minus sign at the front to account for this. If the data were for the increase in product concentration, then we wouldn't need the minus sign at the front to give a final positive value. Looking at the rate as the reaction proceeds, you can see that the average rate decreases as we go along. This is what the graph showed us as well. We looked at the factors that affect reaction rate in the last video. One of them was concentration. As the reaction proceeds, the concentration of the reactant decreases because it's being used up. That means that the rate of the overall re reaction is decreasing as well. So the average rate's all very well, but sometimes you want to look more precisely at a rate, and for this we use instantaneous rate. Whereas the average rate is the average gradient between two points, the instantaneous rate of a reaction is equal to the slope of a line that's tangent to the curve at that point. We write this as a differential using a small d instead of delta. If you've done calculus in maths, you'll recognize this notation. If you haven't, the idea is not complicated. In the expression for average rate, you're calculating the average gradient between two specified points. Now imagine bringing those two points closer and closer together until the distance between them is infinitesimally small. This is effectively the same as calculating the gradient of the tangent to a single point, and this is what the small d means. So we have average rate measured over some finite interval of time, and we have instantaneous rate, which is the rate at a particular instant in time. So which of these are you looking for when you do an experiment? Well, ideally you want instantaneous rate. This is the most accurate way of looking at the rate of reaction. However, sometimes, for a variety of reasons, the data isn't good enough to give you an instantaneous rate. 
In such a case, you use the average rate, but you try to make the time intervals that you take your measurements at as small as possible. The more frequently you measure your data, the better the picture you'll have of how the rate is changing. With some reactions, you can't measure anything until the reaction is finished. For instance, if you're waiting for a specific color change, like in the iodine clock reaction. In this case, you're forced to measure an average rate across the whole time of the reaction. This is fine and it can still give you good data. Final note, in investigations, the most important part of your data is the initial rate. This is the rate at the moment that the reaction starts, the starting speed, if you like. Make sure you collect good data right at the beginning and you can then look at the effect on this initial rate of some variable like the concentration of a reactant or the temperature of the reaction. So here are a couple of tasks for you to try before going on to the next video.